Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Reardon. Dr. Reardon grew up in Houston, Texas, where he attended Baylor College of Medicine. He completed a five-year general surgery residency under Dr. Michael DeBakey in the Baylor Affiliated Hospitals and a two-year cardiothoracic residency under Dr. Denton Cooley at the Texas Heart Institute. He started and um, ran his own private practice as well as served on the full-time faculty of Baylor College of Medicine, where he was a professor of surgery with tenure, chief of cardiothoracic surgery, program director for the thoracic surgery residents, and vice chair of academic affairs in the Department of Surgery. He has spent his entire career at the Methodist Hospital, serving in numerous administrative positions, including president of the medical staff. He currently is a Well Cornell Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery, Allison Family Distinguished Chair of Cardiovascular Research, Senior Attending Surgeon at the Houston Methodist Hospital and Clinical Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery at MD Anderson Cancer Center. He serves as Medical Director of the Nurse Practitioner Program at the Methodist Hospital. He has written over 400 medical scientific papers, books, chapters, and abstracts, and frequently lectures on his research and clinical interest of cardiovascular disease, thoracic aortic disease, and cardiac tumors. Dr. Reardon serves on the National Steering Committee for the Core Valve IDE Trials, Sertavi Trial, and Reprise 3 Trial. And he is the National Surgical PI for the Sertavi and Reprise 3 Trials. Dr. Reardon has been married for 41 years to Robin Reardon, and they have two daughters, Robin Heather, age 39, and Rebecca, age 35, and three granddaughters and a grandson. Please help me welcome Dr. Reardon. Well, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk to you. And fortunately, we're going to talk about surgery because I'll be done in an hour. If we talk about my grandkids, you'll be here at dinner time. <laughs> so we're going to talk today a little bit about percutaneous aortic valve replacement. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the data because I think you need to understand it. Then we can talk a little bit about the procedure and what it means from a nursing perspective and what it means, I think, just from a, where the field of medicine is going. Uh, I do have a lot of conflicts of interest. I, I do serve on a lot of national steering committees and I am the national PI on actually three trials now because we just added the low risk trial. And, and so we're now down to the lowest risk we're randomizing against surgery. Now, what I didn't show you is a slide that I usually show. It's a slide from uh, Brunwald and, and Ross that was published in 1968. It's a very classic slide. And what it shows is it shows survival over time with aortic severe stenosis. And it slowly do it goes down every year until it gets symptoms, and then it plummets, plummets. So these older patients that we see that have severe aortic stenosis and are symptomatic, the average mortality is somewhere between 1% and 4% per month, depending on how sick you are when you start. Now, 1% per month is pretty bad, but most of these people in their 80s, it's 2% per month, per month. There's not many surgeries that are, uh, that are cancers that are worse than that. And that's why all our guidelines say that if you have symptomatic spheric stenosis, you should get in operation and get your valve replaced. The problem was people looked at this, and what they found was between one-third and one-half of the people that had severe symptomatic aortic stenosis got nothing done because they were sick or they were older. And the concept was, well, you're just too old to have anything done. And they were just basically said, okay, you're going to die. Now, we'd always give them some medicine, but there is no medicine that works. It may make you feel a little bit better, but it doesn't help your survival at all. In fact, if you look through the entire English literature, there is no article anywhere of medical therapy that helps improve the survival of aortic stenosis. And the reason is, is aortic stenosis is just like if you went in the backyard and turned on your hose and put your thumb over the hose. You know, the more you cover up the hose, the more pressure builds up behind your thumb. And that's what your heart sees. And when you get symptoms, that's God telling you your heart's not keeping up with this, and you're going to die. And the only way, get, way to make it better is to take your thumb off the hose. Now, you know, in the 80s, we said, well, listen, we're putting balloons everywhere else. Let's put a balloon in the aortic valve. Let's blow it up and see if they get better. And indeed, we could actually open it up some. We could usually double the orifice area and a half the gradient. The problem is it always came back. It just returned. The, the calcium grew back. The valve became stiff again. And so the survival was no better than medical therapy, which is what? No therapy. And so people then decided, well, what if we could figure out a way to hold it open with a stent? We're putting stents in everywhere. We put a stent in there to hold the valve open, but then we have to have a valve inside the stent that falls into place. In fact, there was a guy named Henning Anderson that was over in the Netherlands, and Henning uh, actually was at a meeting where he was talking to Juan Palmas, who invented one of the early stents. He said, 
listen, Juan, you know, why don't we put a valve inside your stent and, and make an artificial valve? And Juan said, you're crazy. So he goes back to his medical school in the Netherlands and says, I want to do this. They tell him, you're crazy. You can't do it. So he goes against a heart surgeon. And at night, they buy a pig and they, and then they, they experiment at night of building this valve and then putting in a pig. And lo and behold, it worked. But nobody would publish it because everybody said, you're crazy. Then a guy in Paris named Alain Cribier, who was working on the same thing in 2002, did the first man who was not an operative candidate, and he replaced his valve with a stent valve, and the guy lived. Alain got the first paper, but Henning had the patent. So if you have a choice between the paper and the patent, my advice is always take the patent. <laughs> Henning did okay. And so that's kind of what led us and started us on this journey. Now, the interesting thing about Henning is 11 years later, somebody very close to him had a stented aortic valve, his dad. His dad was too sick for surgery and ended up having one of the valves that his son helped develop and saved his dad's life. So it's a really pretty cool story. Now, some of the best data on these valves have been developed in the United States where we did some randomized trial. This was the Partner B trial. The Partner B trial was for the Edwards Sapien valve, randomizing a transcatheter valve against medical therapy and people that were deemed too sick for an operation. Now, remember what I told you, medical therapy is basically no therapy, but we didn't know. I mean, who knows? It was, it, this, the valve may kill off as many people as, as the no medical therapy. But what we found was that at one year, two years, three years, four years, and five years, there's a 20% advantage to having a valve. And in fact, if you look at the yellow line, the standard therapy, they were allowed to get balloon aortic valve replaced. There's actually only one patient alive at five years. That patient's had three aortic uh, balloon valve replaces. So medical therapy is not too good. And these are, these are older patients. They're almost 84 years old. So th that led to the Sapien being approved. And then this was the core valve trial that I was involved in, and we wanted to do the same thing, but by the time the, the partner trial came out, randomizing against medical therapy was no longer considered ethical. We, we, we all kind of knew it, but we had to prove it to the FDA, and by the time this came out, the FDA said, well, you can't do medical therapy because they're gonna die. So we had to set a performance goal, which we basically used the 95th percent lower level of survival, I mean, the, the best survival of the medical arm of, of the partners. We took the survival and put confidence levels, two, de two standard deviations out, we took the lower one, so we have to beat that. And that performance goal was 43% at one year and 57 at two years, and clearly beat it. So core valve got approved very quickly. So now we could use these in people that weren't candidates for surgery. This was a partner A trial, and this was people that were considered high risk for surgery, but operable. And so they were randomized against surgical aortic valve replacement. And if you look at the survival curves, what do you see? They're exactly the same. Now this is a much less invasive procedure. So it doesn't have to be better than surgery. It just has to be as good as surgery, because tie is gonna go to the runner. So the, the, the first ones were inoperable due to other things. These people are just high risk. So these people are 83 and a half years old and they have other things going on with them. The, the estimated mortality at surgery was 15% to get into this trial. And so it was exactly the same. So that led to this being approved in the US for high risk. Now this was the core valve trial. And this was interesting because we randomized against surgery, same, same set. But what we found at one year was we had statistically significant superior survival to surgery. This is the first time we'd ever seen that, not just for TAVR, but for any device. There's never been an interventional cardiology procedure that had better survival than surgery. So this is really a big deal, and, and it was also a big deal because of the way we did our statistics. You know, we'd all fall asleep if I talk about statistics, but it had to do with we used a one-tail alpha because of the way we did it, and everybody got all upset. So I got to present the two-year data where we did a two-tail alpha, and we were still statistically superior. Now, by the time we got out to three years, we lost our statistical superiority. We only had a two-tail log rank of 0.68, but just because we're getting the lower number, but you still had a 6%, 6.2% survival advantage for a catheter valve. So now you have a less invasive procedure and better survival. Now in the partner A trial, the other problem was there was twice the stroke rate in the catheter valve than surgery, 5% versus 2.5%. And they, the strokes weren't looked at very well. So in our study, what we did was we everybody got NIH stroke scale before and after and got seen by neurologists for any changes. And we actually had less strokes in the catheter valve. So this is starting to look pretty good. If you look at all-cause mortality or major stroke, which is that's what your patients want. They want to be alive without a stroke. That's what these older people want. Stroke scares them to death. It actually was statistically superior all the way out to three years for the core valve. All stroke, uh, statistically superior for core valve. If we look at MACE, major adverse cardiovascular uh, and uh, cerebral embolic events, statistically superior for TAVR. So now all complications are less for a less invasive. So for me as a surgeon, well, it's looking kind of nervous. I'm going to call my wife and say, no more shoes for the grandkids. I don't know if I'm going to have anything to do. Now, the other thing that we found that was very interesting is that surgery tended to have more life-threatening or disabling bleeding with transfusion, more acute kidney injury, and more atrial fibrillation. Now, why is that important? 
every one of these has an early effect on your mortality and an ongoing late effect on your mortality. Whereas TAVR had more major vascular complications, which are going down as we get better and smaller devices and don't have as much effect on your, and pacemakers. And pacemakers over the early going don't seem to have any effect on, on mortality. As we move to younger people, that may be a little more dip, maybe a little different. These people are still 83 years old, so getting a pacemaker at 83 year old is not a big deal, but some young guy like me at 63, you really don't want a pacemaker if you can avoid it. Everybody got better whether you had surgery or whether you had, uh, whether you had a catheter valve. Your, your NYH class went from 3-4 to 1-2. In fact, we also looked at a thing called the KCC, Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Quality of Life Score. And when you use that metric, if it goes up five points, it's considered a small improvement in your quality of life. 10 is modest. 20 is a huge improvement, like you see after a successful heart transplant. For both of these, it improved 25 points. So both surgery and TAVR improved your quality of life and to an equal degree. The difference was, if you had a transdermal TAVR, you were there in a week. If you had surgery, it took you six months to get there. But by six months, you're all the same. Now, the other thing that was interesting, if you look at the echo findings of effective valve orifice area on top and mean gradient on the bottom, you want your effective orifice as big as you can, the hole the blood's coming out of, and you want your mean gradient as low as you can, and TAVR beat surgery at every time point. That meant that these valves were beating the valves I could put in, giving you better flow dynamics than I could at every time point. Now, the one place our surgery always beat these is, is that we had more a regurgitation around the valve with the TAVR valves, because we have to go in this calcified area and there's little chances of leak, where in surgery I cut the leaflets out and I sew it in nice and tight. That's something we're working on. Then we did a subgroup analysis. It didn't matter if you're older or younger, male or female, bigger or little, good EF, bad EF, diabetes or no diabetes, TAVR was favored over surgery. It didn't matter if you had a previous CAB or no CAB, uh, peripheral vascular disease or not, hypertension or not, or an STS above or below seven. TAVR was favored. Now, this, the lower one was kind of surprising to me because it didn't really surprise me that TAVR would do okay in high risk people. When we define these people as we thought people were going to have a mortality of 15%. These are older, higher risk people. So it makes sense if you have a less invasive procedure and it really gets rid of the aortic stenosis, it should do okay. But as your risk goes down, your STS risk score goes down, it should be harder and harder for TAVR to beat surgery. But in this group, TAVR still statistically above surgery, which is a little harbinger of what we're, what we're starting to see now as the newer data comes out. Uh, this, the, the one thing we wanna know of is how did these valves do over time? And how often did they have a rise of 50% in their mean gradient? And it was very low, and actually surgical valves did worse than TAVR valves. Now, this is set up to be better for surgical valves to the 50% raise. The mean gradient for surgical valves was 12. The mean gradient for TAVR valves were 8. So surgical valves had to go up by 6 to meet this criteria, whereas TAVR valves had to only go up by 4. So they started at different areas. We also went back and looked at why did people die in this trial? Because, you know, it's interesting to me as a surgeon, why did people die? Because if I figure out why they die, I might be able to prevent it. So we all broke on the face of the early phase, the first 30 days, you know, that's the early hazard. And you see this yellow line, TAVR, way up high? Why is that? Well, that's because when we started this trial, to get into the trial as a surgeon, you had to have at least five years of experience. And most of us had 20 and 30 years of experience. We were pretty good at this. We were pretty experienced. But TAVRs? I did my first TAVR in this trial. Neil Kleiman, who's my partner, did his first TAVR. Everybody in this trial did their first TAVR versus a whole bunch of experienced surgeons. So not surprising, there were a lot of procedural deaths early on as we were working out this procedure. Now, that, that has fallen dramatically. But by one month, they came together. But then what do you see? You see that the, this is the instantaneous hazard risk. That means your risk of dying every day. You see that instantaneous risk go up in surgery, but stay low in TAVR. And then at, at 120 days, four months, it flattens out. So why does it do that? Well, the reason is, is you take these older people and you operate on them. And what's the definition of death that I'm, that I'm judged by? You have to be alive at 30 days and out of the hospital. And these people stay alive for 30 days. We send them to an LTAC. They just never get better in the health time. They die at two months and three months because they just don't have what it takes to get better. Whereas the Tavers, they went home because they were better. And so this is what, and by the time you get to four months, the people that were going to die in LTAC, they've all died off. And now we're down to how well did the procedure treat you. So if you, if you look at this for, for Taver versus aortic valve, as you go to lower risk, what you really want to see is you want to see equivalent or better mortality. Well, we know the mortality is equal or better in high risk. Hemodynamics equal or better for TAVR. Quality of life, I've already told you, they both, get, they both go up to the same amount. Patient acceptance, I didn't show you any data on that, but you know, that's what your patients want. Everybody walks in my, in my office and says, you know, doc, I, said, I read the internet, I want a TAVR. 
I said, well, you got coronated. He said, I want to have her anyway because it sounds so good. Nobody wants me to operate on them anymore. They want catheter-based stuff. Now, there is a little bit more morbidity, particularly pacemakers and paravalvular leak, and we don't know about durability. And we know about certain surgical valves that have been around for 20 years, and we, but we don't know about the durability of this. An interesting thing is all my fellow surgeons said, we can't know about this because you don't know about the durability. And then I look over and they're putting in a trifecta valve, which has been around for five years. And I go, well, you don't know the durability. He goes, yeah, but this is a surgical valve. Well, no, it's a surgical valve. I mean, if you stick around long enough, even you see surgical valves that you wouldn't think of fail. I put in about 500 Toronto stentless valves because I thought it was going to change the way the world worked. And they worked great eight years, and then they all started failing. And nobody, and they actually pulled it off the market. But we would have never predicted it. So where are we going to go? What, you know, where are we going to go in lower risk? Well, mortality is going to change. We think it's going to change in the same direction. Hemodynamics, they're going to stay the same. They're unrelated to risk. Morbidity, we think it's going to change. Hopefully, it'll change at about the same rate. Quality of life, no, these people all get better, no matter how sick they are. It's going to go up because you get rid of aortic stenosis, your quality of life goes up. Durability, we don't know. The big issue with durability on biologic valves that we know from surgical valves is that it depends on how old you are when I put it in. I always tell people there's two things I know about getting older when we're talking about valves. One is for every year you live, you got one less on this, one less left on this earth. I don't know how many years God's going to give you, but every year you live, you lost one of those. And the other thing is, the older you are when I put a valve in, the slower it degenerates. Nobody really knows why, but it's just a fact. And and what I think it is, I think it's a low-grade foreign body autoimmune reaction. And the older you get, the less robust your immune system is. Like everything else, I'm not as robust as I was at 20. I'm sure my immune system is the same. Patient acceptance? No, even the young people won't catheter about it. So what about lower risk data? Well, there's been an undeniable trend. If you look at the STS predicted risk of mortality as we go from the early trials towards the TVT registry, which is what all the commercial valves done in the US are now, that people just get to choose, you can see the STS going down. In fact, if you look at the STS for transfemoral sapiens last year, it was only 5% versus STS as it used to be in the 10 or 11% range. So people are already voting with their feet. They're already going to lower risk. There's been a number of publications out of Europe that, that in the low to intermediate risk, the mortality is exactly the same. There was this trial that up in um, the Nordic countries called the Notion trial, where they took all comers that were operative candidates but low risk, and they randomized them. And what they found was they, they did a superiority test, a superiority trial, which was really bold in 2009, bold or crazy, depending on, on your point of view. And they had a, they had a composite endpoint of all cause death, stroke, or myocardial infarction at one year. And what they found was it wasn't statistically significant. Well, why? Well, they only had about 125, 140 people in each group. There's not enough people. Now, your statisticians will tell you that the blue line and the orange line are exactly the same. I'd rather have my mom on the blue line myself than on the orange line. And in fact, if you had quadruple the number of patients in the same curve, they would be statistically significant. But the Nordic countries are pretty small, and they don't do anywhere near what we do here. If you break them down to individual things, all-cause mortality, numerically better for TAVR, all-cause stroke, numerically better for TAVR, and myocardial infarction, numerically better for TAVR. And these are low-risk people. So that's kind of interesting. In fact, Europe just gave the Evolute valve CE mark for intermediate risk, largely based on this data. And again, we still see the same thing. For surgery, major bleeding with transfusion, acute kidney injury, and atrial fibrillation were more common in surgery. Those are the things that kill you now, and they kill you later. Whereas pacemaker was more common in, in the transcatheter valve. And we're getting better at that, and we'd like to get to where we don't need any of them. But if your choice is a pacemaker or kidney failure, most of us will take a pacemaker. Uh, aortic leak, worse than TAVR, particularly in this trial, which was a very early trial. Again, that's gotten a lot better. And we have two intermediate trials going down to the next level of risk, intermediate risk, which is defined as a risk of 4% to 8%. We kind of start taking the middle, middle ground. Partner 2A was for the Edwards balloon expandable valve. Sir Tavi was for the core valve. It's a trial that I serve as the international PI on. The Partner 2A trial was a randomized trial with both transfemoral and, and uh, transapical access. The, um, you had to have severe stenosis. I'm not going to bore you with some of the data here. We're going to just, it was the Sapien XT. That's the second generation valve. Now, we're no longer using that at the, at the, at the Methodist Hospital except for valve to valve. We're now on to the Sapien 3 valve. And it was a non hierarchical composite of all cause mortality or disabling stroke at two years. A bunch of safety things. I'm not going to go into to this because you know, that bores even my doctor friends, and it's what I read when I need to go to sleep at night. 
But this is how it is. Over 2,000 patients were randomized. This is a big trial. These are really good numbers. These are the best numbers we have for valve disease anywhere in the world. And they're tremendously good follow-up, almost 100%. These are still older patients. They were 83 and a half before. Now they're 81 and a half years old. So again, we haven't moved to young patients, but we've now moved our STS down to 5.8. A lot of things wrong with them, diabetes, COPD, and I'm not gonna bore you with some of these things. A couple things that are important, anesthesia time, and procedure time, a lot less with, with the catheter valves. Those of you who do these in the, in the hybrid room, when things go well, we'll be done in less than an hour. And they're sitting in the recovery room, and two hours later, they're up on the floor, sitting in a chair, talking to their spouse. Median ICU length to stay and, and total length to stay much less, but you see median ICU length to stay still two days. This is an older trial. We don't send anybody to the ICU anymore unless there's some specific reason. And when we first brought that up, I remember going over to my floor nurses and, and PACU nurses, they go, oh God, you can't send them to PACU on the floor. They're having heart surgery and they got pacemakers. And I go, watch them pacemakers on the floor all the time with surgery because there's these little wires hanging out. And they said, no, no, we don't want anything dangling out of the neck. That's much more dangerous than wires hanging off the heart. And I had to promise that I would come by to the PACU and come by to the floor. But now that everybody's gotten used to it, it's great because they're not much different than taking care of hernias most of the time. In an hour or two, they're up on the floor. And what did they find? Well, if you looked at this all-cause mortality disabling stroke, TAVR did numerically better than surgery. Didn't do statistically better for the whole group, but it did numerically better. And again, you don't have to do better than surgery. You have to do as well as surgery. So if you looked at its primary uh, endpoint, it met non-inferiority by a long margin. A non-inferior doesn't mean not the same as, but it does just mean non-inferior. If you looked at the as-treated population, again, numerically better for TAVR. A bunch of subgroup analysis. The only one that really did worse is the ones was transapical, meaning I make a hole in your chest and put it right through your heart, not surprising. If you look at the intent to treat, TAVR almost out outdoes surgery, 0.05. That's on the verge of statistical significance. But if you look at the as treated, not that what we thought we were gonna do, but what we actually did, we actually have statistical superiority. Now, 80% of the trial was done transfemorally. So we now have another trial that if you do get done transfemorally, you can have statistically superior data to surgery. Some of this I'm not gonna bore you with. Again, you know, the, the interesting thing is the major vascular complications are now getting closer and closer together. And what does surgery have? Bleeding, acute kidney injury, and AFib. Again, that's not, going, that's not going to go away as we go into the lower groups. Everybody gets better. Your NYH class gets better. The, uh, you have better flow hemodynamics for the catheter valves. You still have more paravalvular leak, but now it's down to 8%. And what we do know is if you have moderate or severe paravalvular leak, you have more risk of dying. So we do want to avoid that. I'm planning on presenting the SIRTAVI trial at ACC in 2017. I can't give you the data now. I don't know the data now. I'll get the data in about January, so I'm chomping at the bit to see my data for my intermediate risk trial. My suspicion is it will be at least non-inferior, which is all I need. I'm certainly hoping for another superiority trial, because I'd like to sit up the ACC on the podium and say, we've got our second superiority trial. Uh, there's an S3 trial, which was a non-randomized trial that they compared back in a propensity match against the surgical arm of, of partner 2A. You know, you, you can kind of do that. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it, it, it was an interesting thing. I'll just get you through so we can talk a little bit more about the nursing, because I get the statistical analysis. I find it interesting, but most people get somewhat bored by it. But what we found is that compared to surgery, uh, for the primary endpoint of death stroke or AR, it was clearly non-inferior. But if we go back and do um, uh, superiority testing, or you end up being superior to surgery. And if you do it for the individual components, mortality was superior, stroke was superior, however, surgery did better for paravalvular leak. Again, I can sew a valve in better than I can put one in with a catheter, so far, so far. But there's really cool engineering stuff that's making that go away. And if you look at the unadjusted time to event of all-cause mortality or all-stroke, you look at the, the S3 data, it beats the surgical data by quite a bit. Now, you really can't do statistical analysis of any relevance because they're two different groups. But clearly, when you propensity match them, you can see that the blue line, or the new S3, is beating the surgical arm of intermediate risk. And now our moderate severe paravalvular leak rate now is down to 1.5%. 1.5%, that's getting pretty close to surgery because surgery is about 2%, 0.2%, I'm sorry. 
And there's two low-risk trials coming up. One is the Edwards trial that's run by Marty Leon at Columbia, Mike Mack in Dallas, and, and the other, or Edwards, and the other one is the Medtronic Evolute trial. I'm the surgical PI on that Jeff Potma at uh, Beth Israel is the uh, medical PI. And that's the last big randomized trial that we're going to see that's going to really change the face of how we treat valve disease. Now, at Methodist, we put in the direct flow valve, the Lotus valve. I ran that trial too, the Evolute R valve. We're actually starting on the Evolute 2.0. It's going to be called Evolute Pro, uh, the next iteration of that, and the Sapien 3. And what I don't have on here and I need to add is the Portico valve. So every valve that's being trialed right now, we do in this hospital. Some of the interesting things, if you look at the direct flow at one year, no moderate severe paravibrally, none, zero, with only a 22% mild leak. Again, starting to look more like surgery. You look at the Lotus valve and the Reprise 2 from Europe, no moderate severe paravibrally leak in one, in one year, and only 11.4% mild. That looks a lot like a surgical valve. And this valve is interesting and that I can take this valve and I can deploy it to 100% deployed and locked into position, and I can look at it and decide if I like it. If I like it, I'll let it go. If I don't like it, unlock it, I can move it. I even had, we had one we put in that looked too small, and we, because we could tell it wasn't compressed, we pulled it, popped right out. We just took it out, chose the next larger size, put the next larger size in, and it was perfect. So it's getting down to where some of these newer valves, we don't ever have to even let go till we're 100% satisfied. The Sapien 3, it's a balloon expandable. It's a really nice valve. It works well. One of the issues with it is when we blow it up, it is what it is. You don't get two shots at it. You've got to get it right every time. We get it right 99% of the time, not 100%. And then the Evolute valve is an interesting valve in that we can deploy it 80%. We can look at it and decide if we like it. If we like it, we let it go. If we don't like it, we can actually pull it back up and replace it into a different position. So we get several swings at it. And like most things in life, it's nice to have several swings at it. And this moderate severe paraviral leak rate at one month, we see it decreasing. And at one year, we see it decreasing. So that some of the problems we had early on, and really just barely over a decade, barely over a decade, we've solved a lot of these problems. So I do have some predictions as we go forward that I think is going to impact what you see as a nurse. By 2020, we'll largely solve PVL. It'll be similar to aortic valve with engineering design and improvements. And there's some other stuff that we're going to see. This is. Uh, uh, stroke volume of the left ventricle and TAVR versus surgery. Do you want a good stroke volume? Of course you do. Stroke volume is how much you eject each time. When I operate on you, your stroke volume falls for about six months. Why does your stroke volume fall if I operate on you and I fix your valve? Because I have to stop your heart. I stop your heart by shooting this cold cardioplegia. I freeze it. You know, it's not like going out in the cold for a half hour. You know, you're not good for a while. The heart has to thaw out and it takes it a while. Whereas we don't do that in TAVR. And so we see a fall in stroke volume. Now, for most people, that's tolerated because you have a lot of reserve built into your system. But if you can avoid it, it's not a bad thing. And we also see more right heart failure in, in surgery. Again, because I have to freeze your heart with cardioplegia, which I don't have to do. I don't have to stop your heart for tavern. So as we move forward, surgery hurts the heart for at least six months. And this isn't going to change as we move into lower risk people. Lower risk people will tolerate it better, but it will still hurt their heart. We've talked about that a little bit. Now remember that surgery is a very mature technique. Where Taver's young technique. Again, I did my first Taver in 2011. I did my first AVR in 1983. So it's a little bit different, and, and you know, and, and our teams are not just the, the implanters, but the teams are a little bit. You know, if we bring a new surgeon in, I give them a team of nurses and ICU people who know how to do it already. Whereas when we started Taver, we all had to learn this together. So the technical disasters we saw with TAVR are already decreasing, and they'll decrease further as time goes on. Now, the other thing that's interesting is, is, is surgery, uh, surgery is a, it's a technique-driven thing. It's something you have to learn to do. Things that are techniques takes 10,000 hours to be an expert. You've got to do it over and over and over again. It's like playing the piano. The only way to become an expert is to play it over and over and over again. Whereas TAVR is more technology-driven. So think of that, think of the comparison of, of a thoracic, descending thoracic aortic aneurysm. Even an easy one with a good neck at each end is somewhat complex. And if you don't do them all the time, you're probably not gonna do that great a job as a surgeon. But I can take any one of you in here to my hybrid room and say, okay, now put the graft here, now pull the string and let the graft go. Look, you fixed an aneurysm. You know, it, because technology is easier to learn than, than technique. Now the good news about that is, is that right now, the average surgeon in the U.S. does eight aortic valves a year. Eight. I mean, do you really want your mom operating on by somebody that's doing eight of these a year? 
But with, with, with Taver, places that don't have surgeons do a lot are going to be able to have teams that can do this and do it well because it's easier to learn. When we started, we used to ask which cases are bad for surgery. If they're bad for surgery, maybe we'll do TAVR. Now we're starting to say which, bad, which cases are bad for TAVR anatomically. If they're low enough risk, maybe we ought to operate on them. We're really changing the way we think about this. And so, you know, we used to look at things as, as risk. And when we first started, as people used to draw these four risk boxes. But there are no boxes. There's a blending of risk from low risk to high risk. And there used to be at some point, we'd just quit operating on people because it was too high a risk. But then we got, then we got valves approved for extreme risk, but there's still a red bar beyond which we don't go. There's some people that are just so sick, it's not going to do any good to replace their valve. I can always make your aortic valve stenosis better, always. But you know, if you have no lungs, and no kidneys, and no liver, it doesn't matter, you're still not going to be any better. You're going to have a good valve, you're just going to die with a good valve. So there are some people where, where, it's, where it's futile to treat. And then there's a bar which we haven't gone below so far, because we're trying to get the data to that. But now both of these bars are moving to the left. The real question is going to be, how far do they move? And the truth is, if we have durability, what we're going to do is we're going to move this bar all the way over here. Now, why is this important? Well, because last year, I think we did 212 TAVRs. We do on an average six a week now. If we just work 50 weeks a year, that's 300. And, and I, it's going to go up from there. We've just taken our intermediate risk which was a randomized trial, and we've now moved into a non-randomized phase. So if people are intermediate risk, I, can, I no longer have to randomize the surgery. I just offer them a TAVR valve. That's going to bring in more people. I now can offer low-risk people who are expecting a valve, a 50-50 shot of getting a TAVR valve in a randomized trial. That's going to bring in more people, and it's going to drive up our surgical volume too, which is going to be good. And I think that you know the, the good news is the throughput of these people through the hospital tends to be pretty good. And it's going to be important to understand the procedure and what it means. So most of these people, 92% of them are done transfemorally. We do it percutaneously. We close the arteries with this little special knot tying thing called a proglide. So they don't have to lay flat for six hours like they do after a heart cath. Within a couple hours, we start to be up and walking around. These valves relieve your aortic stenosis instantaneously. If we, we, if we were sending all our people to the ICU, our ICU, which is already backed up, would be impossible to get through. We probably send one in 10 there now for specific reasons. And most of them just go to the ICU and to the floor. Now, the good news is their time on the floor tends to be fairly short. And for the most part, it's my impression that it's, they're not overly difficult to care for, but you have to keep a couple things in mind. When I do a surgical aortic valve, I have to put you on pump. The pump's primed with two liters of salt water. And when, you have, when you're injured and surgery is nothing but a fancy injury, your body hangs on to salt and water. And then we, pour ice, then we pour fluid into you in the ICU. So as soon as you leave the OR, you're volume overloaded in surgery. Whereas with TAVR, we don't give you that much fluid. And you don't go on pump. And so they often come to you volume depleted. In fact, the last guy we admitted to the ICU came over to the PACU and he was hypotensive and we kept giving him bomb. He didn't come up quite as fast as we wanted. We CT'd him to make sure he didn't have a hematoma. And eventually, once we caught up to his volume, he did fine. And did absolutely normally. But you know, he was volume depleted. And it's just it's hard for us to kind of make that, that jump sometimes. You have to get used to, doing, to dealing with pacemakers that are different than, than surgical pacemakers. Most of the surgical pacemakers are out by the time they leave the ICU. But a lot of these are still left in. And they're in the jugular vein. And they're hooked to a pacemaker, a non-sterile pacemaker can. But we try to tape them down so that the patients can't see them and you can't see them and nobody worries about them. And they're just walking around. So it's like having you know, another bandage on their shoulder. And that's worked out well most of the time. I can only remember one time where it caused us some trouble. And there was this really sweet little 87-year-old guy who was up there with his 85-year-old wife who had been in a tavern on. And one day, we get this code, uh, code blue to her room, and we all go running in there. And he's sitting there, and she's sitting there, and he's got a pair of scissors. And he's cut off every one of her telemetry leads and her pacemaker lead. And he said, well, doctor, it was bothering her, so I brought these scissors in. And fortunately, she wasn't pacemaker dependent, and she lived. But the, the poor old guy, he just wanted to take care of his wife. And, and evidently, she had complained about this, and the nurses would not take her leads off, so he just cut them off. So, so, most, so, so most, most of the time, it works. Now, bear in mind, I predict that this year, half of our aortic valves are going to be done transcatheter, which is going to, going to change things. And we just started and just consented our first patient in our transmitral. So it's now extending out to the mitral valve. So I think that what we're going to see in the, in the, in the coming decade is an assault on all the valves, much the way PCI assaulted the coronary arteries. 
Now, just like PCI, or once it got pretty good and they've got our good sense of it, they started PCI and everything, there's some swing back. We have some data now from Syntax and other. There are some people that are good to operate on, and it'll probably swing back. You know, you probably right now in the current time don't want to be doing 50-year-olds because most of these healthy 50-year-olds we can operate on in hospitals like this with almost no mortality. Now, the other thing that's going to impact is choice of valves. You know, there's two, there's two kinds of valves you guys see. You see mechanical valves, which you have to put on Coumadin, we see tissue valves. Most of my patients don't want mechanical valves. Why? Nobody wants to take Coumadin. You know, it's rat poison. Nobody wants to take rat poison. And so they want, a, they want a tissue valve. The problem is, is that if you look at the longevity of the valves that are out there and the longevity of your average lifespan, well, about 60 is when it's kind of reasonable based on the guidelines to start putting in tissue valves in the aortic position. If you look at 20-year data of mechanical valves and tissue valves, even for people between 50 and 60, the 20-year survival is exactly the same. The trade-off has taken Coumadin on one hand for mechanical valves and the bleeding that comes with that versus the the theoretical risk of a future operation and the risk of that. So why do I say things are changing? Because now I don't have to reoperate on these people. I can just go up to their leg and pop in a valve inside their old valve and they go home in two days. And in those, the pacemaker rate is almost nothing and the paravalvular leak rate is almost nothing. Why? So instead of this irregular calcified, you can have inside of a nice round stent. And so they tend to work pretty well. So now we're, you're going to see more and more people from a nursing perspective, even younger people, coming to you with tissue valves. So uh, it's a little different. <laughs> the aortic valve is this. The mitral valve is this. I have another slide I didn't want to show it because it's kind of a sexist slide. It shows, it shows an on-off switch for the aortic valve, and it says, like this whole console with all these dolls, and because it's, it's the same thing that, that here's a man, here's a woman. You know, men are pretty simple. I gotta get up and eat breakfast. That's it. I'm okay. So let's see. We don't want to go through all this. That's too much stuff. Nobody cares about this. Those are all the valves that are coming down the pike. Interesting thing about this: in the last year, two billion dollars was spent acquiring mitral valve companies. $2 billion. You know how many cases have been done worldwide? Less than 100. Now, I'm not a math guy, but I can. But I had 102 billion and realized they paid a lot per case to acquire these companies. That shows you the, the, the level of interest that there are in these valves. And we're just going to zip through this because I'd rather just sit and talk if you guys have questions and go over the mitral. The mitral is really complex. We, we could spend hours on that. And um, the good news is, um, you know, we're going to be we're going to be put, start putting our valves in first. So I'm going to end there because I don't want to take too much time because, you know, the definition of a good meeting is one that ends early. And a great <laughs> meeting ends early and has food. So we're on the verge of having a great meeting, but I will stop and answer any questions. Sure. Fire away. To, to put these in? Yes. So the, the answer is no, but the, but the question that, that, well, technically the answer is no. To get paid, the answer is yes. The question I get asked more often as a surgeon is, do you think this will become all cardiologists in a couple of years? So right now, and, and the answer for them is no, they don't really need me either. We do better as a team because, you know, my senior guys, Neil Kleiman, Neil and I, you know, we, we have different backgrounds. We think about things differently. So for 90% of the cases, it doesn't matter, but for 10% that are somewhat complex, we bring different viewpoints and different skill sets, which really help. Um, I can show you a, a really interesting video of a guy that uh, ruptured his aorta when we did this, and we put him on bypass and saved him. You wouldn't want to be there just as a cardiologist. But then I can also show you a guy that included his right coronary artery, and I wouldn't want to be there just as a surgeon, because one needed me and one needed, one needed Neil. But it was actually interesting, the American College of Cardiology and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons got together when this started because they realized what a disaster carotid stenting was. So many people were fighting to do the carotid stenting, vascular surgeons, cardiologists, neuroradiologists, that they basically got no funding for it because they all basically beat each other up to the point of telling you know, point, this guy's no good, this guy's no good. And then finally, that, the, the CMS just said, well, we're just not going to pay anybody. So the ACC and STS got together and said, no, we're going to do this, we're going to do it as a team. So if you want to get paid, you have to be seen and signed off at high risk by two heart surgeons and one cardiologist. And in the procedure, there has to be a cardiologist and a surgeon both substantially involved in the procedure. And each one of them has to be one of the billing, so it's billed as a co-surgeon. So you know, the way they do bill co-surgeons, they take like 130% of, of what the fee is and then divide it up between two people instead of a surgeon and an assistant. 
And that way it forces everybody to do this. Now, there are a lot of sites where the surgeon just stands in the corner. Here, where we tend to be more active, I got very involved in this because I wanted to make sure that the younger generations of surgeons didn't get boxed out of this. Also, this was really pretty cool stuff and fun to do. Uh, so, so we're really, we're interested. So if, if the cardiologists don't come in the room, could I do this by myself? The answer is yes. Do I want to? No. I think one of the reasons why we led the core valve trial and we've led in every trial we've been in with our results is because we have a team approach to this. Other questions? Yeah, so there, there are some anatomic things that make us choose one valve over another valve. I, most of ours have been the core valve family. Why? Because I do a lot of research for them and I have a relationship with them. And, you know, some of it is made just based on that. Uh, just like surgical valves, you know, should you use a, you know, a Carponte Edwards versus a St. Jude? Well, you know, sometimes you just have a relationship with the company. Both the valves are the S3, which is the current generation Edwards valve, and the Evolute, they're both good valves. They have about equivalent results. But for people that have narrow sinuses, they do better with a balloon expandable valve. There are certain valves that when they get to the upper limit of core valve, until I get my next size of core valve out, do better with an S3. And we like to, we like to keep the team you know, involved. So our tavern days are Tuesday and Wednesday. Next Tuesday is, is Evolute Day, and next Wednesday is S3 Day. And we, you know, we try not to bounce back and forth. And one of those will be a, a portico trial case. I would say that probably 90% I could use either valve on, and 10% have a specific reason where one valve or the other would be better. Yes. Sure. So, so what we do is we, 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 we puncture your groin on one side, and I put in a small sheath, six French. And through that, I put a pigtail in your non cornic cusp so I can see where the, the valve is and take pictures. On the other side, I puncture the groin, and I put in a big sheath, generally about 18 French. And through that, I go up there with a catheter and a wire and I cross the valve into the ventricle. Once I get across, I put a stiff wire in there because I need the support. Then I go in with a balloon and I rapidly pace you at about 180 to 200 and I blow up the balloon and I just crack the valve open, soften it up. Now I take the balloon out and then I put the valve in. Now what we do then depends on the valve. If I'm doing an S3, it's a balloon expandable valve. I get it in the valve, I run it over the wire, get it inside your valve, I get it lined up where I want to by taking pictures then I pace your heart rapidly, I blow it up, that shoves the valve out, I hold it for five seconds, I let the balloon down, I turn the pacemaker off, your heart rhythm comes back, and you got a new valve. I mean, the whole thing takes about, once you're in position, 10 seconds. Uh, and, and literally, from start to finish, you can be done in 30 minutes if everything goes really, really smoothly. For the Evolute, it's a little different. We blow up the balloon with a valve, but then we go in with this valve, and being nitinol, which has a memory like a spring, instead of having to crimp it on a balloon, we load it inside a sheath, and so we pull the sheath back, it flowers in the position slowly. So we're turning a wheel, pulling the sheath back, and watching the valve flower into position. When it's two thirds deployed, I still have hold of it, but it's in position and it's working. And I can take a picture, I can do an echo, and I can decide if I like it. If I like it, I'll let it go. If I don't like it, I can actually pull it back up in the capsule, move it, and take a second swing at it. Now, the other valves are a little bit different. You know, the, the, the Lotus valve is, 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 a, is a nitinol valve. You don't have to pace at all, it's never obstructive, and you can go all the way to 100% lock and decide. The direct flow is no metal at all. It's all cloth. It's hollow cloth, two rings with struts and a valve inside it. And when you blow it up under force, the rings go out and the struts come up and it pushes everything out. And it just shoves it out of the way. And, and you, of course, your sinus, it just, it, well, so, you, so normally your sinuses, you, your air is normally not straight. You normally have sinuses. Now, the reason that you have sinuses is that it decreases the stress on your valve leaflets, number one. And number two, when your normal, when, when my, if my valve is normal, it actually opens before the pressure in the ventral gets above the aorta because as the heart starts to shorten, the annulus starts to expand out and it pulls apart in the middle. And then the pressure in the heart gets above the pressure in the aorta, valves, the blood starts to go out. And then even before the pressure reverses itself, because your sinuses are bigger than the aorta, they, you get eddy currents in the sinuses. So halfway through the system, the, the valve starts to partially close. And then when the pressure reverses, then they close the rest away. So they don't go from completely open to completely closed. It lets them close softly. And so you have these spaces, sinuses. Now, the real question is, once I get rid of sinuses, what's that's gonna, what is that going to mean to durability? And we don't really know. You know is, is that going to affect the long-term durability? Because we really don't have sinuses anymore. They're still full of valves. And, and that's, uh, there, there's a lot of unanswered questions about this going forward. 
Now, right now, and I'm convinced if you're, if you're 80 or above, if, you know, if I had an 80-year-old parent, I wouldn't let anybody operate on them. I wouldn't do it. I don't care how good they look because you're not worried about a 30-year horizon on them. You, know, you just want to get them in and out of the hospital. If you're 80, taking six months to heal from heart surgery may be a significant amount of your remaining time left on this earth. Now, if you're 50, that, that's a little bit different. But that's how it works. And they, they all deploy a little bit differently. There's a, there's a nuance. Now, one of the issues, it used to be we just had one valve to deploy, core valve. It was easy to learn all the sizing. All the, Now we have five different valves we deploy. Each one uses a different sizing logarithm when I, do my, when I do the CT measurements. Each one is a little bit different in deploying. And so it is somewhat complex. Now, I, I suspect when all is shaken out, we won't have five valves on our shelf. You know, three of the valves I'm doing are part of trials that I either run or I'm part of the executive steering committees of. And, you know, we want to, as, as a researcher, I want to get these valves approved. I think it's going to be good to have five valves on the marketplace. Eventually, right now, there's two valves. Anybody want to guess what these valves cost? Huh? How much? Okay, so 20? Somebody said 10? Does 20 and the 10 want to hold arms and add themselves together? It costs 30 to $32,000 a valve. Yeah. And, and, and the reason is it cost, it took these company, it cost these two companies a billion dollars to bring this to market. Not that much to make the valve, but it cost a billion dollars to bring it to market. How much? Well, nothing, because they're all, they're all Medicare pay, whatever the Medicare copay is. Well, because well, Medicare, just like, so Medicare says, if, if you're going to do this transcatheter valve, here's what we're going to pay you. I don't care what the valve costs, here's what you're going to get paid. That's how Medicare works. So when I do an AVR, if I put in an expensive valve, the hospital makes less money. If I put in a cheap valve, the hospital makes more money. Now, the reason, the reason that we tend to do reasonable financially on these things is they don't go to the ICU, and, and they tend to go home a little earlier. Because where do you really spend your money in the hospital? You spend it in the procedure room, very expensive, and you spend it in the ICU. Once you get to the floor, the hospital's not paying any. I mean, you know, we're all up there working anyway, and you've got you to feed and water people. So unless people are ordering a lot of tests, there's not a lot of real cost of being on the floor. But if we, if we shorten the time in the procedure room and we eliminate ICU time, the overall cost goes down. But now you have a $8,000 valve versus a $32,000 valve. It's got to go way down. Now, once, right now there's only two companies on the, that have commercially available valves. They're not going to get in a marketing war. You know, they, they've got the, I mean, it's, the country's pretty well evenly divided right now. But you add a third valve, that's an odd man out. You know, you know, if you have one guy chasing after you, that's one thing, but when the second guy comes, those two guys are going to start competing. That's just how guys are. And valve companies are the same way. You know, gonna, once we get a third valve on there, and, and you know, we, if we get down, if the price got down to 20000 this hospital would start. We already have a positive contribution margin. A positive contribution margin is not profit. It's, it, it's, it, it's what you get paid minus the actual cost of doing a procedure, it doesn't count any of the indirect costs at the hospital, like the administrator's salary, you know, the keeping the lights on type stuff. And, and indirect cost is this, this funny number they make up of how they, how they, what they think my piece of this is for every case that I do. So, you know, and if, if the price fell by $10,000, the hospital would make a boatload of money. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this is the year before we started our program, we did uh, 235 open, isolated aortic valves. The year after we started our program, we did 337, because people were coming in looking for this, and a lot of them just got operated on. And that number has persisted till last year when it started to fall off a little bit. Now it was like 305 last year. Now that's going to fall, and Taver is going to going to continue to go up uh, at some point. But it actually increased the the number of standard aortic surgical aortic valves and, and surgical aortic valve has the second highest contribution margin in cardiovascular care the highest is transplant heart transplant but we don't do many of them so the hospital makes a boatload of open on open AVRs so you know when 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 my when this at first had a negative contribution margin they're all telling me Mike you're losing money you're losing money I'm going but you know we we drove another heck hundred cases through your hospital. And what they, also don't what they also don't calculate is every one of these people gets a CTA up with John Mamarian, for which the hospital gets paid individually. They all get multiple echoes, for which the hospital gets paid individually. Half of them were cath here, half of them were cath elsewhere, for which the hospital gets paid individually. And so, you know, the, the hospital rarely calculates these upstream and downstream numbers. They don't want to. 
because then they would show you how much money you were really making. And as you all know, the hospital's actually doing over pretty well. <laughs> I mean, they're building my, my, my great brand new building over there. It's going to be great. It's going to open in 2018. I'm going to cut the ribbon with one hand and sign up for Medicare with the other hand. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. Anything else that I can answer? Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure talking to you.